But despite the ire it might draw, this spelling does have an interesting history, and it's connected once more to New York City. Hello, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond, and one of those memos pertains to words. Over the past few weeks and months I've looked in general at British American word differences, as in the different words each country uses to describe the same thing. But often it's not the words themselves that differ, but the letters we use to compose them. Indeed, the two countries are well known for their spelling conflicts with words like humour, recognise and licence taking centre stage. That was another one. But another commonality between these spelling differences in particular is that they were all on my radar long before I moved to the United States. Indeed, along with the likes of grey, colour and programme, these are among the more popular entries on viral memes like this. The thing is, the longer that I've lived in the United States, the more I've come to realise that these are just a tiny collection in a much broader network of spelling differences. Indeed, many of the American variants go beyond the spelling reform rules laid out and popularised by Noah Webster, and in some cases were in fact the original spelling. This could account for why I haven't encountered them before I ingrained myself in American life. And so, here are seven British American spelling differences that I only learned after years of living in the United States. It could be something about the fact that licorice is unrelentingly awful that I couldn't bring myself to consider its spelling. But it occurred to me recently that I'd never not known it to contain the letter Q. You see, in Britain, the word is almost always spelled like this, gaining influence from the unrelated word liquor. And now all I can think about is absinthe, which somehow tastes of licorice without containing it. It's weird. Anyway, America, not to mention Canada and Australia, incorporates a different spelling, that being this. Now this is closer to the old French spelling, so think twice before accusing the Americans of concocting yet another abomination. If in doubt, blame the French. Though, you know, do have a word with America about Twizzlers. Anyway, after that titbit of information, it's time to move on to entry number two, a word that featured in this very sentence. The British comedian David Mitchell once remarked that Americans eschewed the British spelling of titbit because they were too prudish to use such a risque word. But anyone familiar with American English will recognise that this explanation doesn't hold water. Firstly, how do you explain perfectly innocent American English phrases like double fisting or hob day? Seriously, look them up. Moreover, an examination of the word's history shows us that America's preferred usage of tidbit is actually older, having been first attested as tidbit with a Y from the 1620s. Of course, it just happens that English migrants made their way to the New World from then on, with tidbit presumably going along for the ride. Little did settlers know that the word saw an evolution back in Britain later that century, with titbit first attested from 1690. Furthermore, the word tit actually referred to something that was small rather than, you know, the obvious, while tid meant something that was tender, soft and nice, which is in the same ballpark as our next entry. At this time of year, as the storms of icy dandruff confine us to our homes, this word is probably in greater use in both countries. But when it comes to the written word, Britain and America don't spell it the same way. I should know, for the first 27 years of my life, the word cosy was always spelled with an S. No exceptions. See, it never occurred to me that this was unusual. After all, words like raise and despise also incorporated a Z sound. Z sound, and on both sides of the Atlantic. Nonetheless, cosy is among the many words where the Americans opted to substitute the S for a Z. On this occasion, the British spelling is more in line with the word's origin, the old Scottish word colsey via Norwegian, because of course it is. Unlike much of America's spelling reform, however, the word cosy does not appear in Noah Webster's first dictionary, and it is unclear when the United States axed the S. Oh, and speaking of axes... While I've only ever written the word axe in relation to He-Man, Gimli, and, well, axe throwing, I've never had to think twice about how to spell it. A-X-E. Indeed, an American spell checker has never given me the red squiggly line of death for doing so. Mostly because that spelling is wielded in the US too, but sometimes, ever so occasionally, Americans will chop off the final E, both when writing the noun and the verb. And according to the Oxford English Dictionary, this two-letter word is better on every ground of etymology 
etymology, phonology, and analogy than axe, which became prevalent in the 19th century, but it, AX, is now disused in Britain. In other words, AX is the older spelling. Of course, British-American spelling differences also arise when you're chopping not just logs, but earth. I'm just going to be honest with you. I am not a farmer, at least not a good one. I get too attached to the animals and always wake up after 9.30, so it's little wonder that the word plough and its various spellings was lost in my particular pond. When I did have cause to use it, though, I never knew there was any other way of spelling it than this, since its pronunciation is consistent with words like this, uh, but not so much cough, or though, or rough or through. English is more drunk than me. Maybe the American equivalent does make more sense after all. You see, in the US, this simple four-letter spelling conveys the exact same word after Noah Webster included it in his first American dictionary of the English language. Despite that, though, the longer spelling was actually more prevalent in 19th century American texts until the two words flipped in the early 1900s. The OW spelling has remained more common in American English ever since. Funnily enough, our penultimate entry enjoyed a similar trajectory. Surely among the greatest words in the history of English, the word behove has enjoyed quite the evolution down the centuries. But then, if you're American, you probably detected that from the way I pronounced it. Basically, as regards this spelling difference, two key things occurred during the last 200 years. First came the emergence of two different spellings, each initially with currency in the United States. And as recently as the 19th century, both iterations of the word would have been pronounced behove. And then the second thing happened. The British, who have always wildly favoured the shorter spelling, though admittedly with diminishing returns, began pronouncing it as behove. And those spellings and pronunciations have remained in place ever since. Now, having begun this video with a sweet food item, it's time to bring things full circle. And few things come more sweet and more circular than our final entry. It almost certainly has something to do with the fact that donuts carry less cultural currency in the UK, but I genuinely never thought there was any other spelling than this. To be fair, that spelling is the predominant usage in both the UK and the US, with the first known reference to it traced back to this 1809 book by New Yorker Washington Irving. The home city of Irving is crucial to this story, by the way, because the doughnut itself is believed to have originated there. Indeed, it evolved from a Dutch oily cake in what was then New Amsterdam and has since become a symbol of American sweet treats. However, there persists an often derided spelling in the US embraced by the likes of Dunkin' Donuts and other outlets, D-O-N-U-T. But despite the ire it might draw, this spelling does have an interesting history and it's connected once more to New York City. According to the book Donuts, an American Passion, the alternative spelling was coined in the early 1900s when the New York-based Display Donut Machine Corporation wanted something more pronounceable to appeal to its foreign market. Evidently, that didn't include the UK, where the spelling remains considerably less prevalent. Either way, all this talk of sugar is making me sweat my absolute face off. All the more reason then to watch my next video when all of that will be rectified. That's it for this episode. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to ensure that my videos don't get lost in the pond. A big shout out as always to all of my patrons who make this channel possible. Without you, none of it would be from the research, the technical equipment and the axe throwing lessons. If you would like to become a patron of this channel, you can do so at patreon.com slash lost in the pond. All patrons will have access to my secret live stream and those pledging five dollars or more a month will get that plus my secret podcast and more. Until next time, keep enjoying Vlogmas and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for watching this episode of Lost in the Pond. Don't forget to hit my stupid little face to subscribe and please share this video with the world. Hit me up on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook and if you would like to support this channel please do so at patreon.com slash lost in the pond.